Welcome into EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. I'm Rob Black. Joining me today, CFA and CFP, Adam Phillips. He is EP Wealth's Director of Portfolio Strategy. Year to date, we see the NASDAQ up 16.3%, the S&P 500 up 7.3%, the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 1%. Growth is outperforming value so far this year, very similar to how value outperformed growth last year. So it seems to be working itself out. There is always the sell in May and go away that's coming up because we're deep into April. Let's talk a little about what we saw on Friday. It was a good Friday, so the markets were closed, Adam. The jobs market, something that we're taking a look at, how it deals with inflation, how it deals with potential recession, how it's handling the interest rate. But what did you see in the jobs number from Friday? Yeah. Uh, hi, Rob. So there were a few different takeaways from Friday's jobs report. And overall, I think it was actually quite good. If the markets, the stock market uh, that is, was actually open, I think we'd probably see a positive response uh, by investors because, look, we saw uh, just over 200,000 jobs added. I think the number was 238,000. Uh, net new jobs uh, created in the month of March. This was a little bit higher than expectations. Actually, it was the 12th straight month where the, the number uh, came in better than expected. So jobs growth continues to surprise to the upside, although this was you know, more in line uh, with expectations than those in the past. Um, so it looks like we, we are seeing some slowing here, but the, the jobs market is still incredibly healthy. Uh, we, I, I think the Fed would, would look at a few things beyond that just headline growth number uh, and, and uh, see, see some positive developments. And, and so a couple of things that, that I took away from it, we saw average hourly earnings uh, continue to, to moderate. So wage inflation uh, coming in a, a little bit softer, still elevated, but coming in, I think that the year over year number is now 4.2%. So it's making its way down from, you know, it was, it was uh, well over 5% not too long ago. So it's, it's making progress there. Uh, and then in terms of the labor, uh, labor force participation uh, rate, that number edged up ever so slightly. But if you looked at uh, as we always say, underneath the hood, what was actually driving this number, a lot of the participation increase was actually in those greater than age 55, which is important because I think it speaks to this trend of, of what we call uh, unretirement. We yeah. So much of this uh, labor, uh, labor imbalance uh, was because of those who uh, quit their jobs or left the workforce during COVID uh, and took early retirement. And so it left a lower supply of workers. Now, as time has has dragged on here, we've seen elevated living costs. Uh, maybe people are starting to eat into those savings a little bit more than they had anticipated. We're, we're seeing some people go back to the, into the workforce. And I think that's a positive development. The Fed is likely to see that as, okay, this is all working, going according to plan. We are seeing the, the uh, labor markets come back uh, into harmony here between the supply and and uh, and demand uh, of of the workforce, and so I think all in all, it was a pretty solid report. Uh, we also earlier in the week we got the jolts data, and I think that told pretty much the same story. Uh, that's the job opening uh, and labor turnover survey, and and so we we talk about this every month when we get the new data. But if you if you recall, it wasn't too long ago, uh, about a year or so ago, that the we we had about 12 million job openings in the U.S. This number is now down just shy of 10 million. So we've seen the number of job openings uh, come in uh, quite a bit. And I think that's what's helped uh, the um, uh, wage inflation start to moderate a little bit. So I think the Fed is likely to see that as a positive sign as well. Jobs are so critical to our economy. It's good to hear your perspective, even though new terms like unretirement, it really shows you how things with COVID and supply chain really kind of threw our economy for a loop. As far as the jobs market, it's just not as easy to analyze as it used to be. I'd like to go back to those pre-2019 or the pre-COVID kind of days. Um, let's talk about the consumer because this is a consumer-focused show today for sure. Uh, the jobs, the consumer is well-employed. How about the retail sales number? Um, is the consumer getting tired? I think that's a piece of data that's coming out this week. It is a piece of data coming out later this week. So we'll get that number on Friday. And right. look, I think the story last year uh, was, was we were talking about the incredible resilience of the consumer. And we know we are a consumer-driven economy. And so that's where we, we focus a lot of our attention. And it's been really, I, I'd say, surprising to many people 
that uh, the consumers have been as resilient as, as they've been over the last uh, year plus here uh, in the face of, of all of these various types of headwinds, right? Um, we, we know um, the uh, supply shortages and all these things that, that drove up the cost of living and, and the cost of, of goods and services in our economy, yet the consumer has continued to spend. Uh, and we're starting to see some signs of pressure there. I think it was it was really, we were all asking ourselves when it would happen. It was not a question of, of whether it would. It was just a matter of time. And so I think we are starting to see some cracks beginning to appear. Uh, we'll see what that data uh, shows on Friday. Um, but, you know, it wasn't too long ago. It was back in January that we saw over a three-month gain uh, in month over month in retail sales. That number was incredibly strong. Uh, obviously set up a difficult uh, comp uh, for the uh, for the February number. So not too surprising that uh, the most recent number that we have showed a slight decline, about four tenths of a percent. And so I, I think broad estimates this time around is for another month over month decline. Um, but overall, I, I, I think it's important to see where those declines are coming from. Are people spending less at, say, restaurants, dining out? Um, are they spending more on, on goods? And so I, I think it's uh, it's so as is so often the case, it's so important not just to to focus on that headline number, but but take a deeper look and and see where these trends are and what they're saying about the health and the mindset of the consumer. Um, but so far, I'd, I'd say that it's still uh, relatively strong, showing some cracks. We've talked in the past about how um, one of the the trends that we are following is the increased use of credit cards. Uh, maybe people are eating into their savings a little bit more. And we are starting to see that play out in the form of higher credit card balances outstanding. And so not too ideal uh, of, of a situation here, as we know that interest rates uh, on credit cards have been increasing along with the Fed's uh, um, policy rates. Um, average uh, interest rate on credit card debt is, is somewhere around 20% now. And so we know that uh, most, if they had the choice, wouldn't, uh, would not would rather not be uh, adding to credit card debt right now. But uh, so it, I think it says a lot when we're starting to see that number increase. Well said. Um, so obviously a lot of the state is going to come back to the Fed, but let's hold off on the Fed for one more little bit of commentary. Um, the credit tightening that you talked on tied towards the uh, consumer we're also going to see the regional banks pull a little bit of credit tightening after Silicon Valley Bank and a couple of the other banks in the United States showing some some um, struggle in headline. It seems to have passed. It seems to have boiled down, uh, calmed down, simmered down. Uh, and yet it, maybe it's on the horizon that regional banks will be a little bit tighter with giving me a mortgage, giving me a refi, um, giving me a, a business loan, giving me money if I was a farmer for a tractor. Um, are the regional banks going to play into helping the Fed by making lending a little less active, which means a little less speculative money flow? Absolutely. I, I think it, it, it certainly helps the Fed and, and uh, means that they potentially have to raise their policy rates uh, less than maybe a lot of people expected, um, say, two months ago or, or, or several weeks ago before all this uh, dramas and, and issues started to surface across the banking system, and in particular the regional banks. Um, but one of the, the trends that was already in place, actually, uh, over the last few quarters was we were starting to see some, uh, some tighter lending standards across the banking system. And so I think this is only going to um, is to increase those lending standards further. Um, and so if, if banks are less willing to, uh, to, to lend uh, to their, their depositors, to their customers, uh, then I, I think that obviously uh, will only help the Fed's case. It, it means that they have to do more on their side because uh, the rest of the the economy um, is is really doing it for them. And and so I, I think that that is why we've seen a lot of movement here in the bond market. Investors are now positioning for uh, maybe a lower terminal rate, meaning a, a a quicker end to the the policy tightening than they were expecting before, just because they think a lot of that tightening is going to come from uh, outside of the Fed and actually from the banks themselves. It's interesting that you bring that up because we're still going to I'm still going to ask the question because everyone still wants to know at the next Fed meeting, do you expect them to raise interest rates based on the jobs number that we've seen, uh, where the consumer seems very strong, employed. Uh, retail sales have been holding up because we have jobs. Job equals paychecks. Paychecks equals spending money at retail. And um, the Silicon Valley Bank blow up didn't really seem to cause a virus. It didn't really seem to cause a flu through the markets, um, uh, infecting others. Do you think the Fed is done? Wait and see. Or do you think we get one more interest rate hike or maybe many more? Yeah. I don't want to put all the words in your mouth. 
Look, I, I I don't have a coin, but if I did, I, I really think it would be a, a coin flip right here. Okay. Um, if I if I were forced to make a call, I would say that they are uh, they can they can justify going twenty five basis points more, and that's likely what they will do. Uh, and then they they're they're going to take a wait and see approach, uh, and I think that's that could be the last rate hike uh, that we uh, are likely to see here. And they're just kind of let the economy digest all these. Uh, recent, uh, all this recent Fed tightening, and, and as I said, that that tightening from the banking system. I, I, I can really argue from both sides here. I, I think there's something to be said for waiting. Um, I, I think we've seen some of this data start to moderate, and it implies that the Fed's medicine is working a little bit. Maybe they don't have to uh, focus on uh, inflationary pressures uh, quite so much because the, the medicine is working. Maybe it, it took a little bit longer than they were hoping. Um, but that implies that maybe they could just kind of wait another month or so and and see how the data plays out, see how how the market uh, and the economy really catches up to everything that's happened in in recent weeks and months. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't. I, I think they probably will uh, uh, elect to raise rates. And what's interesting is that they're going to be. So there's the we received the uh, latest uh, CPI print, so inflation data on Wednesday, and then after that, there's not really a whole lot of data uh, be, be, before they meet again uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, conclude their next FOMC uh, meeting on May third. We're not going to get another jobs report after Wednesday's number. We're not going to get another CPI report on inflation, and so I, I think they're really going to be left just um, trying to analyze what's going on within the banking world. Um, that what we will receive are is information uh, related to flows in and out of the banking system. We will uh, receive uh, earnings uh, reports as the earnings season gets underway, actually starting on Friday with the announcements from a few of the larger banks in the country. Uh, I, I think they'll be providing the Fed and investors an update on, on what's actually going on uh, on the ground. And and so I, I think it's these types of things that that are going to uh, influence the Fed's thinking because they're really going not going to have too much economic data to go on between now and then. Let me ask one more question because I'm getting this question from a lot of consumers. Um, the housing market, and this also plays into the Fed in raising interest rates and raising the cost of mortgage. Everything seems to have stabilized. You and I were talking about deposits into the banks have stabilized. Mm. The housing market doesn't seem crazy upset right now. I think we were down about five percent since the summer in prices. I saw one report saying another 15%, but it was making it sound like that's normal and predictable. How do you feel about where we are stable-wise? Because there isn't a lot of drama with the consumer numbers, with the job numbers, with the retail numbers, um, with the credit tightening numbers. And the housing market, you know, it, the last time I saw a housing market correction, it lasted up to three years. So six months to three years. Sounds like a recession, which lasts six months to three years. The stock market, bear market, mm -hmm. six months to three years. It seems like we're just kind of getting trained and we're pretty calm. Are you seeing calm or are you yeah. seeing anxiety out there? Maybe maybe I'm seeing something different. No, I I, I would agree with you, Rob. I, I think that you know people are looking at this in, in a very rational way. You know, let's okay. not forget the fact that prices on a national level rose about 40%. That's true. Uh, in 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 about two years, and so I think it's it's uh, certainly normal to see some type of of correction or a pause here, as people start to uh, acclimate to uh, to higher rates. Right, we've seen mortgage rates more than double from where they were at the beginning of 2022, and so I, I think that is likely to it certainly hurts affordability and and probably makes a lot of buyers uh, think twice before going out and, and buying a new home. Um, and but but I I think even though we're seeing activity slow down, we're, we're seeing prices uh, start to come in a little bit. We're, we were never really worried about a a deep crisis here. This wasn't a housing bubble. Um, no. This was a supply and demand issue. And and so what we have seen in recent months is that builders are starting to get back to work and starting to uh, to start development on on new homes. And so as that supply comes online, I think that'll further help restore that balance, right, between supply and demand in the housing market. But but I, I really think that this is is really just more of a uh, of, of a pause and normalization more than anything else. And I and I would I you know I, I would I would expect that many others are viewing it that way as well. I look forward to more updates in the future with you because I want to feel some anxiety and yet I'm not feeling much anxiety and you're doing a very good job of explaining everything. It's CFA, CFP, Adam Phillips, Director of Portfolio Strategy at EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black for the Informed Investor Market Update. Good day. Mm -hmm.